Hello friends, what a month it has been on the channel. I've had a lot of fun, there's been some huge videos and some great responses, so let's have a look at some of your comments. I did a massive video on Hegel, it's one of the biggest projects I've done in a long time. It had cameos from four other YouTubers in it, and the response was overwhelmingly positive. Bryn Nibawa, Nibawa, hope I'm pronouncing that right, and quite a few other people though, said that I could have done more Hegel in the Hegel video. I could have dived a little bit deeper into what Hegel says and the text itself. I absolutely take your point. Um, I think you're correct. I think in that particular video, although I had a lot of fun making it and, and people loved it, I think I rushed into what can I do with Hegel? What can I say with Hegel? How can I tie it into something that I'm more familiar with uh, and more comfortable talking about? Rather than engaging with Hegel like purely on its own terms, I think I was saying, this is Hegel, and this, more importantly, is what we can do with it. Part of that, I think, was I, I felt a little bit constrained by the YouTube format and the expectation to make something that will be kind of cool and uh, that people will want to watch and that uh, that all the other creators I wanted to take part in it could could you know, really put their name to and get behind. But I think that's that's a very fair criticism you've got, and it's it's very well made. And I will say that if you want people who can make, uh, if you want a really in-depth series of videos that engages with Hegel on Hegel's own terms, then Gregory Sadler is your man, the guy who makes Half Hour Hegel. Go and check it out. That's, you know, the the, the YouTube market on, on Hegel, like really going into it on his own terms from like a really scholarly angle. As, as far as I'm concerned, that YouTube market is kind of done and cornered and he's the man for that. Another criticism I got for that video was in it, I said that the pyramids were built by slaves. Apparently they weren't. Quite a few people wrote me up on that and were like, actually the pyramids weren't built by slaves. Uh, I've never studied archaeology. My apologies. Uh, I'm sorry I got that wrong. Evan W and quite a few other people wondered if the Hegel's master and slave dialectic could illuminate the way that humans treat non-human animals. I'm not sure it can. Just on my understanding of it, I'm not sure that non-human animals would really reach the cognitive capacity threshold necessary to engage in the dialectic. But I am very curious and I'm interested in the fact that quite a few people in the comments section independently made that point. Maybe I'm not seeing it. Maybe there is something there. I don't know if anyone else has written about it, but yeah, interesting point. Thank you. I did a video on Rennie Edo Lodge's book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. And uh, I, I was I was shocked, twofold. It was a twofold shock. Firstly, I was shocked by how well that video did. It got a lot of views, a lot of people really liked it. And usually my videos where I just talk about books, uh, they, they're simpler, they take less time to make, and they, they don't get as many views, and that's fine. That's kind of why I make them. I make them to go in between the main episodes of the show. But this one absolutely blew up. And I was also shocked by just how vicious and toxic the comment section under that video got. Shocked, but perhaps not surprised. I was perhaps naive to think that that wouldn't happen. <laughs> So I just want to address just one point that came up repeatedly in that comment section in multiple different forms, uh, ranging all the way from benign, genuine, curious puzzlement to really, really racist outrage. Some people thought that the title of the book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, was divisive or was an attack on white people or was shutting white people down somehow. And I just want to just dig down into that sentiment for just a moment. The author wrote this book because she was tired of having the same intro level conversations about anti-racism again and again and again. And so the book is a way for her to no longer really need to have those conversations because she's taken them and she's putting them in print. The book itself, it, d it doesn't shut anyone down or stop anyone from having conversations about anti-racism. In fact, if anything, it enables more people to have those conversations because the tools and the ideas we need to have them are now more widely available. When someone, particularly a person of colour, wants to have a conversation about racism, a socio-political system, a force that benefits white people, and we can rush in and say, I feel excluded or I feel hurt, sometimes before the actual discussion can take place. In this case, it was literally some people literally judging the book by its cover, not even getting into its content, judging the book by its title, not even reading it. When we do that, when we rush into conversations about racism and we say, I feel this or I feel that, we can sometimes center our own feelings. We take a conversation about socio-political oppression, a conversation about a topic that is bigger than ourselves, 
and we we make it about ourselves. And that is a very common derailing tactic that people can sometimes do maliciously and people can sometimes do accidentally as well. I'm not pointing the finger at anyone or, or trying to judge or stand on a soapbox or anything. I'm, I'm inviting all of us, myself included, to the idea that sometimes conversations about immoral things that go on that benefit us will make us uncomfortable. It's likely to make us uncomfortable. It's the, it's the bubble of innocence being popped. But that discomfort is a sign that we are moral and empathetic and, and emotionally mature enough to realise what's at stake in those conversations. And we can bear that discomfort. We don't always need to centre ourselves in conversations that are perhaps about something bigger. The tendency to do that, to centre conversations about racism on white feelings, has a name in academia. It's called white fragility. And I know that even just naming it that is enough for some people to go, whoa, whoa, hang on a minute, what? This feels like an attack on me. But just stay curious, stay open-hearted. There's a fantastic phrase that I was taught at drama school. I found it helpful many, many times in my life. The phrase is curiosity, not ambition. It's a fantastic mantra. And that's all I'm gonna say about that for today. Lastly, for today, I did a video on healthcare ethics and postmodernism, which was also a lot of fun. Lyad Milo brought me up and criticised me on two important things. The first is that the gender-neutral term for people of Latin background is Latinx, not, as I said it, Latinx. I'm sorry about that. That's uh, I've only ever seen it written down, and that's my, my lazy northern tongue refusing to get up off the roof of my mouth. Latinx. So, uh, my apologies for that. Secondly, I said rather carelessly in that video, if you don't have your health, you are going to be miserable and you're, you're, you know, being sick consumes everything in your life. It makes people miserable, it makes other things not worthwhile. That was actually an ad lib that I left in, but Liad Milo quite, quite justly criticised me for that. Because that is quite an ableist attitude to take. There are plenty of people out there who are sick, chronically sick, but who nevertheless have lives absolutely worth living. As Liad Milo said, that statement contained within it an implicit judgement about the worthwhileness of the lives of people with chronic illness. So thank you very much for pointing that out to me. I'm sorry, I should have thought that through more, and I'm, I'm gonna try and be a lot more careful about how I talk about sickness in the future because of that, so thank you. Isabel Blabel brought up trans people being denied healthcare. We talked a lot in that video about people being denied healthcare on various spurious grounds. And yeah, you're absolutely right. If I'd had more time, I would really have liked to dive into the research uh, on, on in that particular area and include that in the video. It was an area that I, I lamented I didn't have the time to really do the to do the in-depth research on, but uh, yeah, I think you're right. If I had included that, the video would have been better overall. Hablo Como Gringo asked, what is the name of my chimpanzee? Uh, this is Albert Camus. Uh, I've had him for years and years now. Not since I was a kid, I think I got him, I think I got him when I was at university and uh, I named him Albert Camus purely because I was reading Camus at the time when I got him and uh, it just, just seemed to fit. Little Keegs noticed that I slowed down some of the phrases that I used in that video, like personal responsibility, in a way that ContraPoints does as well. And yeah, that is a trick I picked up from Contra. I think that's a really, really good way of showing like, like the frame of the painting, if you get what I mean. It's a, it's a great way of showing that a certain phrase like personal responsibility deliberately frames the issue in a certain way but that other frames are possible. It's almost it's almost Brechtian if you know your if you know your theatre. It's drawing attention to the device that is being used in order to show you that other devices might have been used and make you question like why is this one the one that I commonly would resort to. Speaking of framing devices, thank you for your concern, but uh, I wasn't actually sick. That was just part of the show. Those are all the comments I have time for. Thank you very much for leaving such insightful ones. And also, thank you for, for being willing to offer constructive and really, really intelligent criticism of the show. Like, I, I, I really enjoy it when people say, I think you could have done, when people say lovingly, I think you could have done this better. And that, that helps me, I'm, I'm like, sincerely, helps me grow as a person. Not just make better content, but like, that, especially that comment about how, about the sickness thing, I'm like, ah, that's like work I can do on myself. And I will be a better person because of what someone on the internet, because of an internet comment, 
I have an opportunity to be a better person. And like that, that's gotta be something special, surely. Without further ado, and in that spirit of wonder and love, and curiosity and ambition, I will leave you with the credits. Patreon.com slash PhilosophyTube is where these sainted folks help me afford rent and food. Alternatively, PayPal.me slash PhilosophyTube is where you could make a one-time donation to buy me a pint if a regular sign-up isn't your thing.